You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. We take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 19. We, uh, we have a lot to get through here this morning. Uh, the, uh, the first draft of my sermon here, I, I, I pared it down a lot. Uh, we could have easily taken this chapter and made three sermons at least out of it. Um, but we have our purposes as we are, are looking to prepare uh, to jump into Romans come October. And, uh, and hopefully, too, in the not-so-far future, we'll take the opportunity, Lord willing, to go verse by verse through the entire book of Genesis and so dig deeper into such things. But as for this morning, we look at, again, Genesis chapter 19. And today we see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which were utterly wicked cities. And we see in our, uh, in our text here this morning the, the wickedness of, of not only homosexuality, but also to the forced sexual exploitations of the men of the city as well. And what we saw is God was going to destroy these cities, as Nate went over last week, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave. As we think this morning about God's wrath, I want us to think also, too, of the patience of God. He is patient. He is long-suffering with the sins of mankind for His purposes. And for his purposes, he has set limits on his patience when he will then cause his looming judgment to fall. Here in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we we see God's response, his holy response to sin. But let us not move too quickly beyond what Nate went over last week. We see that for the sake of the righteous, God was willing to hold back his wrath. He was willing to show patience. And we know from 2 Peter that his patience means salvation. And that by his patience, all his elect will come to repentance. Even from the start, God, having planned to save a people for himself and sending Christ as a payment for their sins, he did not let his judgment fall on mankind immediately. He held back his infinite wrath to bring about salvation, to pour his wrath out on Christ in the place of those he saves. We read, for instance, in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 26. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, or you could say as a satisfaction, by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And we'll dive into that further, Lord willing, when we get into Romans. But here in Genesis 19, God had determined for his patience to run out for Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities in that valley. And these are a warning for all who would persist in rebellion against their Creator. We read in the book of Jude, verse 7, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So as we think of this passage, remember what Nate went over last week in chapter 18. There we saw three men appear to Abraham. And as Nate rightly pointed out, uh, we see actually in the first verse of our passage for this morning that two of those three were actually angels. And though it would seem that Abraham was not aware of whose presence he was in, at least right away, it would come to be clear that one of those three was actually a theophany, was a manifestation of Yahweh himself, of the one true God. 
And there, as Nate went over, we see again the promise of a child reiterated to Abraham and Sarah. And like we saw the week before, this was again met with the response of laughter because of the absurdity of the thought of a 90-year-old woman having a child, a woman who in her entire life was never able to have children. Although this time the laughter didn't come from Abraham, it came from Sarah herself. And the Lord called her out on it, and yet we see her deny it. But that then, that raised the question that we see there in the text that Nate went over last week. The question was, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the obvious answer to that rhetorical question is what? No. There is nothing that is too hard for him. He does all he pleases to do. And then it was at that point that the two angels and the Lord headed off to Sodom. And the Lord revealed to Abraham what he was about to do, which was destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the wickedness of the city. And Abraham interceded for Sodom. And as we saw last week, he asked God if he would spare the city for the sake of 50 righteous people. And God said that he would. But if he could not find 50, Abraham pleaded, would you spare the city for 45 righteous people? And God said he would. So Abraham said, well, what about for 30? 20? 10? And for the sake of 10 righteous people, God would spare Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet 10 righteous could not be found. And as we'll see in our text here this morning, the only ones to be spared would be Lot and his two daughters. So let's read our text here for this morning. Again, Genesis 19, starting in verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, Please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, All the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful to him, they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. 
Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. It is a little one, and my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Now Lot went up out of Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zoar. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, And we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie down with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name ben He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. So, as we walk through chapter 19 here, we see it begins with the two angels coming to Sodom in the evening, and Lot sitting at the city gate. Many point out the fact that Lot sitting at the gate means that he has settled into the city so much and has joined in with the affairs of the city to the extent that he has become a leader in the city. Because the city gate is where the elders and leaders and judges of the city sat. But Lot was a worshiper of Yahweh, the one true God. And so we see the conflict that there is here. We'll we'll talk about this. And in response then to the prayers of Abraham that Nate went over last week, God would spare, not the cities but righteous Lot. And despite what we read here and go over, right, Lot was righteous. And and again, we'll get into that. So when the angels come to the city, Lot saw them, and thinking they were travelers, he greeted them. Uh, He wouldn't know they were angels. Uh, They clearly came in the appearance of men, and, and the text refers to them that way. But, Nate went over last week how when the three men appeared to Abraham, he somehow knew, even though he didn't recognize right away who they were, he knew, though, there was something about them that they were important. And so as we look at this here, Lot recognized somehow that these men, they were not just ordinary passerbyers. There was something special, something important about them. I would assume that that's by divine design. That this is by the providence of God that he would realize this. And so we read, When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. 
Lot's actions here show that he saw these men as more important than himself. He refers to them as lords and sir or sirs, which is, again is a title of importance, of reverence. And he bows himself before them. Verse 2 we read that Lot said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. We see here, for these travelers, Lot seeks to show them hospitality. And some suggest their declining of his hospitality was a polite gesture. I don't know if that's the case or not, but... We see, though, at the time, and in that climate of that place, it would have not been unusual for travelers to spend the night in the streets. But the problem is, Lot knew how unsafe that would be for anyone to do in Sodom. He, he knew how wicked the city was. And so he insisted that they spend the night at his home. And so they comply to this, and they go. And Lot urges them with this, saying that they can eat, and, and they can wash their feet, and, and then they should leave first thing in the morning. Because really, the longer you stay in Sodom, the more in danger you're in. And that becomes clear even as we go through the text here. Now, agreeing to host these men, and they agreeing to stay, culturally they bind themselves to one another. In agreeing to host them, Lot is binding himself to these men in promising then to take care of them and protect them. And these men agreeing to the hospitality are promising not to take advantage of that hospitality and so not to harm Lot or his family. And even as we read how Lot prepares a meal for them, there may have even in that be a sense of danger. With the meal he prepares, he makes unleavened bread. Now, Moses' original audience in writing this would have been those who just came through the Exodus, just came out of Egypt, and so had the Passover meal in which they had unleavened bread. And why did they have unleavened bread? Well, one reason is, is because they didn't have time for the bread to rise. Uh, They had to eat quickly and be ready at a moment's notice to get up and get out of Egypt. And so the idea of the leavened bread here may be the idea that they don't have time to watch it rise. They have to eat and be vigilant. they got to be ready to go in case danger arises which is exactly what we see happen here. After these men were there just a short time, word quickly spread about these travelers in town, about these men. And verse 4 says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. So we see here all the men of the city. Now, as we think about this, though, this can't literally mean all the men in Sodom. Well, why? Because as you keep reading here, you find out, at the very least, Lot's sons-in-law are not there. And so that's not all the men in the city. And so it's likely, too, this isn't trying to refer to every man, but it's the idea that virtually every man is there, and every man that would at least represent every part of the city. We see other translations have, instead of what the English Standard Version says here, when it says, to the last man, others say, from every quarter, or you could say every end. So it's it's representative of every part of the city. And everyone who came to surround the house included young and old. And what were the men of the city there to do? Well, you see in verse 5, And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And what does it mean that they want to know them? Well, if you've read Genesis before and followed the text from the beginning of the book, you would know exactly what is in reference here. They want to know these men, like we read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, that Adam knew his wife, Eve. 
all these men from all over the city, making up much of the city, they were there looking to have homosexual relationships with these men. And not only that, but this mob was looking to rape the two men in Lot's home. Now, over the years, and even not all that recent as well, there have been many who have written to try and show that any homosexual act is not what's in view here in this text. And the mob wanted to literally know these men. They wanted to identify them and understand who they were. So maybe it's out of a lack of trust that Lot would come later and say, this is a wicked thing you're doing. But clearly, as you look at this, this is not what's in view here. You know, and there are those who have gone to great lengths to, to try and argue and try and prove that the Bible does not see homosexuality as a sin. But brothers and sisters, a plain reading of the text in its context just will not allow for us to see anything else. And people can play word games here in Genesis And they can make all kinds of attempts, uh, exegetical jumping jacks, to to make the text say what they want it to say. But the the Bible is clear in what it says. And so therefore, too, we must also be clear. We must speak clearly about sin. Just as in any case, with any sin, whether it's any form of fornication or deceit or hatred, pride, greed, idolatry, We must speak of it as the Bible speaks of it. And we see, when it comes to homosexuality, the Bible says in Leviticus that homosexuality is an abomination before the Lord. And the word abomination can mean disgust or abhorrent before the Lord. That's how Scripture speaks of it. And we have to understand what the Bible teaches about this sin and all sin. Each and every one of our sins is an infinite offense, treason against the God who owns our lives. To water down sin, to speak softly of the things the Bible speaks blatantly on, is to muddy the gospel and is to rob God of the glory of his saving power. Because if he just saves us from mistakes, if it's just the fact that we're, you know, we're not too bad, we're just, we're not perfect. If it's just imperfections that he saves us from, I mean, what cost is that? But if he saves us from an infinite wrath, if he saves us from the enslavement of wickedness, then it must only be God who can save us. And so it is only the cowardly who will not call sin, sin, and speak of any sin as the Bible speaks of it. Not the least of which homosexuality, in order to be politically correct, which should not be labeled as hateful. But to be more afraid of being called a name, care more about that than to care about a person's eternal soul, that is hateful, that is selfish. To be more afraid of Losing one's standing with others. That we would even, when we're talking through a text, uh, gloss over what it says about homosexuality and get through it as fast as we can to avoid as much offense as we can. To not even properly explain the text because we are more concerned about what people think than we are about people's eternal souls. We are more concerned about our standing and our popularity than we are about the glory of God. My friends, that's not a church. I really would want to take more time on this, and I think it's worth it, but we'll save some of this for when we get to Romans chapter 1. And listen, I'm not talking about that uh, as we proclaim the gospel, as we share with others, as we teach God's word, I'm not talking about being a jerk. Uh, I'm not talking about being hateful and being angry with people. I'm talking about loving people. 
And therefore, speaking the truth in love. But to speak the truth in love, we have to speak the truth. It's not loving to sugarcoat the truth or tell half-truths. It's not loving at all. And then how do we get to the gospel and what the gospel truly is, which is God saving sinners from the eternal punishment of their sin? We have to make the gospel about something else if we don't speak of sin as the scriptures speak of sin. We do, we proclaim the truth and the truth of the gospel and we plead with people to look to Christ to be saved. Apart from what Christ has done, the most loving thing someone can do for me and do for you is to speak to us about our sin and the eternal consequences of our sin and plead with us to flee to Christ for salvation, to trust in him alone. And if you sit here and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you know the gospel, you have repented and trusted in him to be saved. Someone did that for you. Should we not do the same for others? We must speak as the scriptures speak. We must point out how sinful sin really is and plead with people to trust in Jesus Christ to trust in him to be saved because the wrath of God is real. We read in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. They're without excuse. No one will stand before God on Judgment Day and say, I, I didn't know, or I thought. All will stand with their mouths shut before the great and holy judge. Now again, as we see here in the text, while hosting these guests, he has obligated himself to protect them culturally. On one hand, then, we see Lot has not been as degraded to the level of the rest of the men in the city. Lot seeking to serve these men and be hospital where the rest of the city just wants to use and abuse these men. Yet at the same time, we see that Lot has not remained unaffected by the wickedness of Sodom either. We see he goes outside, shuts the door behind him, and he pleads with them not to do such a wicked thing. Again, as we first saw Lot, he was sitting at the city gate. So obviously he had assimilated himself into the culture to at least some great degree. And so how could he not be affected by the culture if he settles in there and he makes Sodom his home? Of course it's going to affect him. And we see that he stands to protect his guests, but he does so through compromise, through a wretched compromise. He pleads for the mob not to do such a wicked thing with his two guests, and in order to stop them, he offers them this alternative that in some ways is more wicked. Verse 8 says, Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. He'd rather keep to the cultural contract and show himself as a virtuous host than to hold up his obligations as a father. As the man of his home, he's obligated to protect the most vulnerable in his home. As a father, he was to protect his daughters. So really, this is disgusting. Lot pleads with the Sodomites like he's one of them. He calls them brothers. He thought he had made himself one of them. 
And in some ways he did. As he clearly has been influenced by the Sodomites, at least a lot more than they've been influenced by him. How many times have Christians put themselves in compromising situations and in places of temptation under the guise of sharing the gospel and influencing unbelievers? All the while, they were really the ones who were influenced. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. We need to be careful about the influences in our lives. Now, I'm not meaning to say that we should never be around unbelievers. I'm not saying that we shouldn't befriend unbelievers and be around unbelieving family. That's not what I'm saying. Even just for the sake of evangelism, that's not what I'm saying. But we should be careful who we do spend the great majority of our time with and in what situations we put ourselves in. We need to be careful of and aware of what influences us. And so make sure that we are spending a great deal of our time with our church family, with other believers, so that we can encourage one another, hold each other accountable, instruct each other in God's word, that we would influence one another unto Christ-likeness. Now, Lot's offer of a wicked alternative, that actually didn't matter to these men who were bent on fulfilling their conquest of homosexual lust. Which, by the way, then, we should recognize the power of lust, whatever our lust may be. The lust of the flesh have a a controlling, enslaving drive demanding to be fulfilled and can push us to all depths of evil. Can drive a person. And so, my friend, as a follower of Jesus Christ, if you find any sort of lust in you, you should be seeking to put it to death and understand the dangers and the power of unchecked lust in your life. Sin is deadly. John Owen said that we better be killing sin or else it'll be killing us. He's right. Now, clearly, again, Lot has had little to no influence on these men of the city. As they say, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. And they're suggesting that Lot, calling their actions wicked, was just a self-righteous judgment of a snobby outsider. So they didn't see him really as one of them. No, they just saw him as a snotty carpetbagger. That's it. And they said, Now we will deal worse with you than with them. And the mob moved to force their way past Lot to break down the door. And it's at this point there in verse 10 that Lot's guests reveal who, or maybe we could say what, they really were. They graciously grab Lot from outside, pull him in, shut the door behind him, and then they struck every man at the entrance with blindness so that they could not find the door. Then the angels ask Lot if he has any other family in the city, and if so, to get them out. And that's when they reveal their intentions. They say, the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And there's an urgency to their work. The Hebrew word for destroy here is the same word used for the destruction of the flood earlier in Genesis. This judgment on Sodom will be a destruction that will completely wipe out the city and everyone in it under the burning wrath of God. If Lot got other family in the city, he had to act now to get them out. And the reason for destroying the city was as God told Abraham earlier, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord. Because it was such a wicked place that there was a cry for justice, a demand for judgment against its people. So Lot goes to his sons-in-law, those who were the men who were betrothed to his daughters. But they didn't take him seriously. They just couldn't comprehend the seriousness or the fact that the Lord would do such a thing. I mean, what's so bad about Sodom? I mean, sure, it's not perfect, but does it really deserve to be utterly destroyed? I mean, come on now. 
you know, there are people that when you talk to them about God's wrath and God's wrath against them, that they will not take it seriously. They may say things like, no, I worship a God of love. My God is loving, and so my God would never send anyone to hell. And I love Ray Comfort's response to that. He says, you're right, your God would never send anyone to hell because your God doesn't exist. But there are those, the majority of people, as we see, the proverb says that most men will declare their own righteousness in their hearts. Most will say, yeah, I'm not perfect, but I don't deserve eternal hell. I don't deserve judgment from God. And so they deny it. But all they do is prove all the more God's word. We read in Proverbs 28, verse 5, it says, Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. We understand all things when we know the Lord. We understand his holiness and the infinite offense our sin is against the God who created us for himself. We understand justice and that we have earned his infinite wrath. This is why we must preach the law of God. We must uphold his standard of justice before people. We must speak of sin as the Bible does and plead with people to run to Christ to be saved because there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name given under heaven to men by which we must be saved. Jesus alone saves. Then in verse 15, When morning began to dawn, the angels urged Lot to get out with his wife and daughters so that they would not be swept away in the judgment. And so what did they do? Read there in verse 16, it says, but he lingered. Or you could say, he tarried. Lot waited. Dude, this place is about to become a pile of ashes and you're just hanging around? What's wrong with you? See, even with all its wickedness, Lot still had made Sodom his home. Its influence made its way into Lot's mind and heart. And he couldn't get himself to just leave it. So the angels were like, fine, if you're not going to leave, we're going to take you out. So they grabbed Lot and his wife and daughters, and they set them outside the city. And this is described here in verse 16 as the Lord being merciful to him. They could have been like, listen, you love this place and all of its filth so much, then you deserve to burn with it. That would have been just. But they grab Lot and they show him mercy. God is merciful to him. And how merciful is God towards us whom he saves? Even in our faulty thinking, even in our backwards view, our selfishness, and in any part of the, this evil world that, that still has some hold on us, the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve. Again, it would have been perfectly just to leave Lot behind in his foolishness, but the Lord had mercy. And then the angels urged Lot and his family to get as far away as they can, to get out of the valley, and say, don't look back. And don't stop anywhere in the valley because God's judgment was going to destroy the entire area. And so don't look back. Don't stop. You need to tear your heart from Sodom. Completely and utterly forsake it. And really, that's what the true believer needs to do. Uh, We must take any love there is for this world and every aspect of this world and we must forsake it. We must tear it from our hearts. We cannot love the things of this world and this evil world and yet still love God. We read, for instance, in James chapter 4, verse 4. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? The world and all that opposes God must be forsaken. The angel tells Lot to escape to the mountains in verse 19. (laughs) And what do we see Lot do? He protests politely, but still. He says, oh no, my lords. And though he acknowledges the kindness and mercy he's been granted by being saved from the destruction, he claims he can't make it to the mountains. 
And why? I don't know. Maybe he was thinking that he's too old and so he can't move fast enough to escape the judgment. So what does he say? Well, we read verse 20. He says, Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. And he puts an emphasis on the size of the city, that it is a little one, and it's almost as if Lot is trying to say, you know, I'm only making a, a small request. I'm only asking to go to this, this little place. Isn't it little? They grant the request. They won't overthrow that place if Lot goes there. And so too then, that city became known as Zoar, which means little. And then when the sun had fully come up, Lot and his family were just getting to Zoar. And verse 24 says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And the whole area was destroyed with all of the life that was in it. And verse 26 says, But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. She did not tear her heart from Sodom. She was not able to altogether forsake the city. She still loved the things of that wicked place, that worldly place. And so the Lord killed her, entombing her in salt. And then the text brings us back to Abraham. At dawn, Abraham went out and saw the smoke of the land, and then it went up like the smoke of a furnace. Man, as we think of Abraham pleading with the Lord, interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah last week, uh, to go out and see that, uh, what disappointment that had to be for Abraham. Man, there, there wasn't even ten righteous in the cities? Not even ten? But verse 29 says, So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. In response to Abraham's prayers, God did spare the righteous. Because Lot was righteous. He was. He was weak. He was immature in his faith. But we see there was a difference between him and the Sodomites. Although, maybe a small difference. And clearly his righteousness, though, was not his own. But this was that righteousness that is by faith. We know this for sure, because how does the Apostle Peter speak of Lot? We read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as the, that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented, tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. And so if he could rescue Lot, Peter goes on to say, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under, under punishment until the day of judgment. Again, clearly he was not righteous in his own righteousness. But neither are you and I. Righteousness only comes to us by faith. But we see too, a believer may struggle to let go of remaining sin. A believer may struggle to tear sin from their heart. But if one is truly a believer, the Lord will bring that work about. The Lord will not allow the true believer to remain in their sin, to remain in unrepentance. So if one does continue in unrepentant sin, that should raise the question of whether or not one has truly been saved to begin with. If you never do battle with your sin, if you continue to love your sin, where's the evidence that the Lord has saved you? Uh, where's that change that he promised he would bring about? We said faith produces work. So where is that work? To show that you really believe that you really have faith. You know, all of us have faith that continues to need to grow. And, and we see Lot's faith had to grow. He was immature and weak in his faith. But nonetheless, he had faith. And then we see here that Lot 
did not feel as though him and his daughters were safe there in Zoar. It's probably because it, too, was still a wicked city. It was going to be originally overthrown with Sodom and Gomorrah. But God spared the city for the sake of Lot. So he probably looked at the wickedness and thought, you know what, God is at some point going to destroy this place, too. So not feeling safe, they went to live in the mountains where the angels originally told them to go. And they lived in a cave there. And it would seem that Lot's daughters felt that, well, if, if Zoar is going to be destroyed, then that's going to be the whole world and there's going to be no one left. And so who's going to continue on the human race and, and bring about offspring? And so the oldest devised a plan with her sister to get their father drunk and have children by him. They had to trick him and get him drunk because he would never agree to it himself. We read there in verse 36, Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The son of the oldest was named Moab, which means from my father, or could also mean who's my father. And he was the father of the Moabites. The younger daughter's son, his name was ben which means son of my people. And he was the father of the Ammonite nation. Both nations would be enemies of Abraham's descendants, Israel. And so we see the long-lasting consequences of sin. We see the ripple effect of sin. And really, if we think about this narrative, uh, this historical narrative, the ripple effect in all of this really goes back to even when Lot first chose to live near and then live in Sodom. Friends, sin is wicked. Sin is deadly. Sin is enslaving and is an infinite offense against an infinitely holy God deserving of an infinite wrath. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding city was temporary, but all the wicked who died there face an eternal punishment. My friends, I deserve an eternal punishment. And so do you. And how do I know you deserve an eternal punishment? Because the Bible tells me. We'll see that when we go through Romans. We are all sinners from conception in our first father, Adam. And as sinners, we sin. We've broken God's law. We've earned his wrath. But the grace of God is such that no matter our sin, no matter its magnitude, no matter its prevalence in our lives, There is forgiveness and freedom in Jesus Christ. For all who are in Jesus Christ, all who trust in him alone to save them, he has stored up righteousness in his righteous, perfect life. He has met the righteous demands of God's law for sinners in his death. And because of the righteousness he has stored up, he has risen again. And he is alive. He has paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. We who believe, we have this salvation in him alone. My friends, without him, we are all condemned sinners in of ourselves before a holy God. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor rivalers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. So Paul says to the Corinthians, such were some of you. Were some of you. Not, Not you are, you were. Because when you came to Jesus Christ, you were no longer who you used to be. You are born again. There's been the circumcision of your heart that is done only by Christ, not with human hands. We are no longer who we used to be. So my friends, let me ask you, do you find yourself in this list? You do. All of us do. You may say, no, I've not done those things. I'm not an adulterer. My friends, Jesus said, if you even look with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. And in that very same chapter in Matthew 5, he said that if you have unjust anger, you're guilty of murder. 
Because again, God's standard is so high. He does not just judge our outward actions. He judges the condition and intents of our hearts. Because he is that holy. So which one of us can stand? Have you ever been greedy? Have you ever wanted what you did not have and, and been ungrateful for what you did have? My friend, each one of us are in this list. None of us deserve to inherit the kingdom of God. And we will not in of ourselves, no matter how hard we work to be good. We cannot make up for our sin. But what does Paul go on to say? But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Because of the work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, who all turn to Jesus Christ alone for salvation, are saved. And we are changed. And we're no longer who we used to be. So you are not the same if you are trusting in Christ. God is holy. And being holy, his wrath against sin is real. And so if you are not trusting in Christ, if you've been trusting in anything of yourself, I plead with you, turn from trusting in anything of yourself. Repent of thinking of yourself as good and instead flee to Jesus. Trust in him alone and whoever trusts in Jesus Christ will be saved. There's only salvation in Christ and in Christ alone. My friends, trust in him today. Do not wait. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nvbc.com.